violent typhoon whips at Admiral Halsey's third fleet as winds ranging up to 138 miles an hour pound the force as it withdraws from an attack on the Jap homeland. For the second time in less than six months, our fleet has been caught in a typhoon common in the China Seas. But this time we didn't lose a ship and only one man was killed. Navy pictures show that these storms proved to be an ally of the Japs. For 21 ships were damaged before they fought their way out of the storm center. A miracle of survival is shown by the Pittsburgh. The typhoon tore off her bow, shown floating there, but she made port. Three carriers in Admiral Halsey's fleet were also hard hit. Planes were damaged, but most were saved. The bow of the Pittsburgh is salvaged by a Navy tug, and they radioed to Guam, we have sighted the suburb of Pittsburgh and taken it in tow. With more than 100 feet of her bow missing, the Pittsburgh, thanks to watertight compartments, got home to have her wounds healed before she fights again. In a single day, over 31,000 returning Yanks enter New York Harbor. The Queen Elizabeth helped set the record, carrying 15,000 happy troops home for well-earned furloughs before redeployment to Pacific areas. The homecoming heroes swarmed the decks of the big liner for a first glimpse of the skyline while a Navy blimp escorts them into port. For these boys, it's a real homecoming, since most of them are from New York and New Jersey. All of them wear the orange and blue shoulder patch of the famous 44th Division, which drove through the Vosges and the Saar into Austria. And what a reception! Marlena Dietrich, a daughter of the 71st Regiment, gives them a shapely salute. Lake steamer Harmonic burns furiously near the mouth of the St. Clair River at Sarnia, Ontario. A short time before, the Harmonic, second largest excursion ship on the lakes, had been loaded with 360 passengers. All miraculously were saved by the heroic efforts of rivermen and coast guardsmen who sped to the rescue from the American side of the lake. crane operators saved many lives by hauling trapped persons off in their coal bucket. The vessel was completely gutted by the blaze, which started on the pier at which she was loading and spread rapidly to her superstructure. A major tragedy averted by cool action. A new giant joins the Navy's sky fleet, the 72-ton Mars flying boat first of a series of 20 to be named for Pacific Islands, is christened by Mrs. DeWitt Clinton Ramsey, wife of Rear Admiral Ramsey, former Naval Aeronautics Chief. As the sky giant slides down the ways at the Martin plant in Baltimore, it becomes the largest flying boat in United States service. It has a 200-foot wingspan and is 120 feet long. Powered with four motors totaling more than 8,000 horsepower, the big boat has a speed in excess of 200 miles an hour and can carry payloads of 30,000 pounds or more. Our Navy adds giant wings to the growing cloud over Japan. Even while the huge Mars is making her test flights, another flying colossus, still larger, is under construction at the Hughes Aircraft Company in Culver City. When completed, this flying boat, to be known as the H-4, will weigh 200 tons and be used as a super cargo carrier. Its freight space will equal that of two freight cars. The construction is almost entirely of plywood. This is the way the instrument panel will look to the flight engineer. This wing is 320 feet long. American aviation is truly on the march. The 
USS Augusta steams into Antwerp, where President Truman is greeted by General Eisenhower. With victory accomplished, the President is on his way to the Big Three meeting at Potsdam with Secretary of State Burns and other aides to work for peace and world prosperity. With little pomp or ceremony, Mr. Truman gets off to Brussels, next stop on his journey. Following a flight to Germany, the presidential party rolls along the Autobahn to Berlin, while the commander-in-chief reviews the might of the 2nd Armored Division. At the little White House in Potsdam, Generalissimo Stalin of Russia is one of the first to welcome the president, as the meeting is recorded by Signal Corps and newsreel cameras. Next to join the group is Prime Minister Churchill, who meets an old conference friend. The big three meetings are held in Kaiser Wilhelm's former palace, and President Truman is selected as chairman of the conference. Here, the fate of Germany and the end of Japanese aggression will be settled. Under the flag that flew over the White House when we declared war on the Axis, the President states our aims. Let's not forget that we are fighting for peace and for the welfare of mankind. We're not fighting for conquest. There's not one piece of territory or one thing of a, a monetary nature that we want out of this war. We want peace and prosperity for the world as a whole. Over the old German barracks in Berlin, the stars and stripes fly in victory. This historic banner has flown over much captured territory, Casablanca, Algiers, Rome, and Berlin. Let us pray it will not be long before it flies over Tokyo. <laughs>